today we get some great revenge against a lying ex. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, my brother lost his girlfriend because of me. I know the title sounds really harsh and sad, and honestly this is still fresh by the time I'm writing this. I'm also still trying to figure out if I did the right thing. So around 7, my older brother, let's call him Corey, did inappropriate things to me. At the time, I didn't know what was happening or how wrong it was, but it happened conservatively around 10 times. He then tried doing it to my younger brother, but he stopped it. At the time, I really loved Corey a lot. He was my best friend at the time, and often when he'd get into trouble, I'd fall on the sword for him. One time he almost burned down the garage by burning cobwebs, and I took the blame for that. When he would sneak electronics when we were younger and get grounded, I'd take the blame so he could hang out with friends. I have no idea why I did this. I just loved my brother. I thought he was my best friend even when he'd beat me up and hurt me and bully me. I was really young, I didn't understand any of it. When my little brother refused his advances, he told my mom and she confronted us all about it. I guess I knew it was something we'd get in trouble for, but I didn't know how messed up it was, so I defended him and chalked it up to my little brother having a bad dream. Even later, me not even knowing how bad it was, even tried doing the same to my little brother because I thought it was okay not knowing that I was forwarding that cycle of abuse. Nothing really happened, but I know I tried, and I still feel guilty over all that. It was really messed up. This I feel especially guilty over, and I told my girlfriend about this too. She doesn't blame me and says it was just monkey see, monkey do, and doesn't blame me, though it still hurts. When it hit me, many more years later, I completely forgot about it all, and I was 16. Then I heard the song Prison Sex by Tool, and as soon as I realized what that song was about, it finally all caught up with me. And when I remembered, it hit me like a ton of bricks. All the abuse, all the bouts of depression, all the feelings that I had no idea what they were. I knew what it meant and everything I had done and what I was made to do. Since remembering all of that, I was in an extreme depression. I started realizing how it affected how I talked to women, how I'm always careful not to be seen as a creep and that even looking at one makes me feel filthy, how anything sex related feels like a curse. It messed with my relationship with my girlfriend and my bedroom habits. I used to hurt me even before I remembered all the abuse and this made things so much worse. I was horrible, but I was still trying to get better. Road to recovery, my parents were also pretty bad. They were pretty emotionally abusive too extreme right-wing, Christian, and anti-vax. You know the type. But after a while of trying to persuade them, I finally started getting therapy. They connected me with Christian counseling, and after a few lessons, I finally for the first time ever, opened up about my abuse from Corey. It was a relief, and I cried during therapy, but I was like getting on a road to recovery finally. Then when coming back from work, my dad told me that my counselor told him the situation. There was a signed confidentiality agreement, but he was able to tell my parents if legal action was possibly able to be taken, and it was. Me and my parents went there and talked things over, and we decided to not take any legal action. Then we talked about it as a whole family, even with my little brother and Corey. My mother made him apologize and made me forgive. I wasn't ready to forgive him. Nothing had happened to him, even after everything I'd gone through. I couldn't forgive him so fast, and he got off completely fine. My parents just wanted to sweep it under the rug. I shouldn't blame them, but it's still wrong. But then Corey got a girlfriend, one who had gone through all kinds of abuse too, and she didn't know what he had done to me. This was horrible. I needed to tell her because she deserved to know, but I didn't know how. The girlfriend. Corey's girlfriend, who we'll call Sarah, was with him for a while. Corey did a lot of things buy her a PC, go out a lot, and other things, but on the other side of the coin, I lived with Corey. I know him. He was a complete other person around her than who he actually is. He wouldn't respect her choices, her boundaries, her consent. Her family was abusive. He would talk harshly against them and intimidate Sarah. He sometimes wouldn't even respect her consent, but she was very clingy and in love. She didn't know all the manipulation. I developed a bond with Sarah, and we talked a few times, but not much. 
So many times I wanted to tell her what Corey did to me, but I stayed quiet thinking he would be mad. Maybe try to ruin my relationship. It was scary, but then everything changed one night. The truth, I was around 17 now, I was doing weed and stuff, and Corey and Sarah wanted to try some with me. So one night in the basement, we all tried some, and of course we were really high, and I was emotional. The thing about drugs, or at least Delta 8, is that it amplifies everything. So the emotions I felt around them, recognizing the abuse, it was all coming to me and I was crying around them. Then eventually Cass needed to use the bathroom, and Corey sent me up to clean some pee that was on the lid. I don't know why he didn't go up, but I went. But as soon as I was done, it was just me and Sarah. So after taking deep breaths, I told her everything. She was mortified as you would expect. I shunned blame her, she thought we were a whole new family, and I just told her that it was all a lie. I felt like Hamlet's father telling Hamlet that his uncle killed me. After all that, me and Sarah wanted to talk about it, but she was over for the weekend and it was hard to get us alone. We texted a lot about it though, but Corey I think saw the texts over her shoulder and Sarah was thinking he suspected us. That night, Corey talked to her about it and Corey even gave her an out. Then in the morning, me, Corey, and Sarah all sat down and talked about it. Corey then said he brought up the situation completely on his own and even gave her an out. The conversation was okay, but I knew that this was clear manipulation. He already suspected us and knew something was up. He only said this to sound like he had more integrity. And his pathetic attempt to give Sarah an out? After being together so long, after buying her so many things, after hooking up, there's no way she'd leave. He didn't give her an out because he wanted to accept responsibility. He did so because he knew she wouldn't leave. After a while, I thought that's where this ended. I told her maybe it her knowing was all the closure I needed, but it just wasn't over yet. The breakup. The issues Sarah had with Corey had gotten worse. Then last weekend, she DM'd me saying that she doesn't think her relationship is going to last much longer. We talked for a while, and she told me all of the issues with manipulation and controlling and crap that was going on. Then as soon as she went home that weekend, she broke the news to him. Currently, she's having them take a 10-day break, but after evening, Sarah now knows. I don't think she wants to get back with him. She had gone through so much and needs to deal with her own issues and find herself first before getting into a relationship. She needs to fight her own demons. She now understands all the manipulation in retrospective and is ready to start moving on, and hopefully I will be too. Conclusion, I'm sorry if this was way too long, I had a lot to get off my chest. As I'm writing this, this is the day after the breakup and Corey is not in a good mood. I'm scared he'll know I was texting Sarah about all of this and he'll come after my relationship. I changed my computer password and activated two-factor authentication on Discord so he can't access her in our relationship. Maybe I'm paranoid. Maybe. I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out if what I did was right. Sarah's really grateful for me and said what I did was right, so maybe just with time I'll feel better. But I think I'm finally going to start feeling free from this abuse. And while I have no illusion it will be with me for the rest of my life, I can be more and ride over that experience with new wholesome and good experiences. And it's easy to get bogged down over how messed up everything is, knowing that the world can be a horrible place as long as people like Corey exist. It could be a pretty cool place too, as long as people like Sarah are around. Because she's so brave for breaking that cycle, saying enough is enough. And I hope if anyone reading was abused too, I hope you can be brave enough to break that cycle too. I mean, even beyond what OP themselves experienced at the hands of this person, if there is somebody that you can tell is in a relationship and they're clearly being a manipulative party against somebody that probably just doesn't know better, I don't think you should feel bad for speaking up a little bit and trying to help them out. Our next story is, gave my kid a birthday party out of spite. Our daughter was born a couple of days before mother-in-law's birthday. My original due date was mother-in-law's birthday, but I had to be induced early, so I was able to pick her day. Sharing birthdays suck, and especially if it's with a woman who doesn't respect you as an adult and boundaries. It was 2019 and mother-in-law found out that she had another grandchild. Brother-in-law found out through a paternity test that the girl he denied was actually his. Mother-in-law backed her son up and once the paternity test was positive, 
Oh, I have another granddaughter. Let's all celebrate my birthday at Disney. The plan was renting a hotel room and all the grandkids visit, which was our daughter, my niece, brother-in-law, and his new girlfriend and her daughter, and my husband and myself. We had to pay for our daughter and us. I didn't think it was right that we would have to pay for us when our daughter's birthday was basically the same weekend and I've been to Disney with her. She sucks all the fun out with her complaining. Our daughter really wanted a party. She was turning nine and she has lots of friends. I didn't want to do a party because of the planning, but mother-in-law was pushing us to go to Disney to celebrate her birthday. I told daughter, hey, how would you like that party? I planned it right when mother-in-law planned her getaway. And when mother-in-law pushed, I said, so sorry, we have our daughter's birthday party then. I printed about 20 invites from Walgreens for the party to be held at the local park. I let my daughter hand them out at the school trunk or treat. She invited about 17 kids. I then let daughter pick the menu and decorations, and daughter had her party while mother-in-law had hers. My daughter had the best time, and I didn't have to deal with the drama of mother-in-law and even brother-in-law and the cost was probably cheaper than all of us going to Disney. At least you could frame this in a way where it's like, oh, I'm sorry, we actually have legitimate reasons to not show up. And I love that going forward, you can coincidentally have the perfect thing to constantly skip out on these mother-in-law indulgences. Our next story is Revenge of the Roomba. So I moved into a downstairs apartment that's fairly soundproof. I haven't heard a sound from my neighbors to the sides, and my next door neighbor only occasionally hears her very large upstairs neighbors. But mine? Oh boy, I lucked out. Even though the apartment expressly forbids it, they've run several illegal and noisy from-home businesses out of their apartment upstairs, furniture making and commercial cooking being the loudest. They also wear cowboy boots in the apartment while stomping around until 2am all while making furniture or loudly unpacking and running industrial kitchen equipment till that time as well. Every time I finally prove to the HOA that they're running a particular business, they just switch up. I've also tried reaching out to them, but they pretended that they couldn't speak English. I've seen them speak to others in perfect English. Their recent venture has what sounds like a router running for 5-8 to hours a day. Still stomping in cowboy boots though. They've banged and stomped and whatever so loud that my dishes rattle and my ceiling shakes. But now, just recently, they stop at 10pm because the main couple had a baby and they go to sleep earlier. So tonight, my petty evil plan begins. I moved my bedroom from under theirs into my office. In my old bedroom, I've placed random wooden boards that butt right up against the ceiling. Each board is a bit of a different thickness for maximum what the freakery and sound difference. I then closed the door to that room and set my Roomba loose in it. This isn't a new style one that maps a room. This is the old school heavy Terminator style that just bangs into things until it dies. I'm now sipping a whiskey sour in my bed while giggling every time I hear a new board vibrating straight into their floor at 1am. This is just another endorsement of not wanting to live in any kind of apartment living. I mean to be honest. I don't know if I would be able to read these reddit stories in an apartment setting. God forbid I lived in an environment like OP does and I'm trying to read these stories and people are like banging on the ceiling like shut up down there. Our next story is ex-boss accused me of reporting his illegally downloaded software so I did it anyway. I'd left the job in what I thought was good terms after 6 months. The work wasn't as challenging as I'd hoped and the company was very small. As a younger person I wanted to be somewhere bigger. A few months later, out of the blue, I get a call from a private number. It was my old boss. He didn't bother to make small talk and went straight to asking if I'd reported his use of downloaded software. I didn't know this at the time, but he admitted it right there and then. It's illegal to make money off software you're not paying for. He was really paranoid and said the software company was on to him, without elaborating. When I told him I had absolutely no idea what he was talking about and that I was quite annoyed by his call, he raised his voice and became threatening. Clearly he'd been holding a grudge. I was so pissed off I reported him straight after the phone call ended. It was unlicensed AutoCAD which is a really risky thing to use without paying. He probably had a notification rather than a report and the paranoia set in. I sadly never heard back from the case. I'm not gonna lie, I've heard of a lot of people using software that was obtained and not a very legal means and using it for their production. I mean, the Adobe Suite is a notable thing, 
for years in the YouTube scene, I've always heard a bunch of people who had like Sony Vegas or Premiere Pro in uh, not very legal means. I'm just wondering how companies actually find out because I haven't really heard too many cases of actually having a crackdown happen. This next story is Music Wars. I was reminded of this petty revenge when I heard a song on the radio, and despite hating the song, know all the words thanks to my little bro. He had a habit of getting home from school, going into his pit, bedroom, and playing his latest CD at window rattling volume, which is A, incredibly annoying when you're attempting to not fail your A levels, UK based, and B, the reason he now has hearing issues. As my folks worked full time, they had no idea about his annoying habit. Q Petty Revenge One day I had enough of his crap and he'd borrowed one of the Mums albums which he was blasting loudly. Paul McCartney Tug of War by the way. Luckily this was an album I liked. As I was moving out soon I'd bought the album on CD so I loaded it up, waited till the next track started, then about a minute into the next track I pressed play and cranked the volume up higher. As a hi-fi geek, I had a better kit than him. The more he protested, the louder I went. So all the time he tried to finish the album, he got his track, then mine blasted louder a minute behind. He didn't do it again. I'm just trying to imagine how the parents are feeling in all of this. Are they just sitting off in the living room, watching a TV they can't hear because the music is blaring so loudly, just like, kids will be kids. Our next story is, Snooty Customer Gets Comeuppance. About 15 or so years ago, I had a very brief stint working at a mobile phone operator in their customer care center. It wasn't the easiest of gigs, and to make it worse, the company argued that 14,000 British pounds a year warranted us to have thicker skin when it came from verbal abuse from customers on the phone. I remember my last day. I was quite content and happy enough that I was leaving. Everyone was nice enough. Then it must have been one of the last few calls. An extremely snooty and patronizing man called up and explained that his phone had been cut off for no reason. I looked into the system and relayed off his contact details and then got the payment info. Turned out they'd somehow took the wrong credit card details in the shop. No idea how that happened, it must have been manual in the day. I then apologized on behalf of the company and asked, could I get your card info? To which the man replied, Oh yes, that would be helpful, wouldn't it, you absolute jerk? I smiled, sat back, and took my hands off the keyboard for what I was ready to enter the key details. I repeated each number he said like I was typing it, and told him he'd have his phone back online within an hour. I have a very simple policy, although very often there is situations where I can be heated. If I'm calling a customer service representative, do not get heated at them and honestly go out of your way to be kind of nice to them because sometimes they might pull some strings for you. The main thing a lot of people say and I keep in mind is it's not the customer service rep's fault that things happen the way they did. Our next story is he needed to learn to be afraid of women. I used to go to a certain 24-hour gas station close to my house around 3 or 4 a.m. regularly because that's when I got off work and not much else was open. It was usually the same guy working. He was always friendly but not really creepy seeming. One night I was just getting some honey and he said don't worry about paying. It was odd but I figured maybe he already counted his drawer or was mad at his boss. Whatever. Then he said hold on I want to show you something and started walking toward the back. I followed him, not nervous, but I prefer a good amount of personal space, so I stayed about four to five feet behind him. He opened the door to the back room, and I could see from where I was that it was just a stock room and it was mostly empty, so when he stepped in the doorway and motioned for me to follow, I stopped and asked what he wanted to show me. Dude lunged at me, grabbed my arm, and tried to yank me into the room. Fortunately for me, I'm really strong, a lot stronger than I look and I grabbed him back, yanked him away from the room towards the cameras, and kind of threw him into a wall. I said, thanks for the honey, witch, and I left. At first I was mad, then I was depressed about it. I thought about calling the cops, but in the place I lived, they didn't even show up for gunshots half the time. I thought about calling his boss, but he'd been there for years, and a lot of times, these things don't get taken seriously. I didn't know what I was going to do, but the next day I went in with my phone, clearly videotaping him, and when he saw me, he smiled. He liked that I had him on video and called me honey and flexed his muscles for the camera. What the freak? 
He literally just thought what he did was cool until I started talking and I let him know in no uncertain terms that I was angry. His response was a nervous, oh, are you going to get your boyfriend to come do something to me? That made me even more mad. Like, why wasn't he afraid of me? He already knows I'm stronger than him, but he had such little regard for women that he thinks what he did was okay. And the only thing to worry about is if I got a man involved. The more I thought about it, the more I started to worry about other women crossing his path. Not all women are as strong as I am, and somebody else may have wound up in that back room. I thought he needed to learn that a woman can be scary and not feel so comfortable just casually assaulting us. I didn't want to hit him and go to jail, so I made a plan, and it was a fun one. I kept going in at random intervals, sometimes multiple days in a row, sometimes not for weeks, sometimes after work sometimes after a performance, dressed in any kind of mask or strange, dirty, sweaty clothes I'd worn on stage. Every time was a new, demented scenario. The first time I put a handful of coins in my mouth. Yeah, it's gross, but worth it. It was well over the amount that honey cost. I walked in, staring at him with a blank look in my face and grabbed a honey, never breaking eye contact. He was not happy to see me this time. He was on the phone and I walked over the counter, but stayed about 10 feet away and just stared. He tried to wave me to the register and cash me out while he was on the phone. He really didn't want to interact with me, and my dead stare started to creep him out pretty quickly. It took about 5 minutes for him to get off the phone. He was weirded out by this time, but he couldn't really call the cops or do anything, because I had him on video admitting to assaulting me. I held my ground and stared. It was so hard not to smile as he got more and more nervous, but I held on for about 10 solid minutes, then slowly walked up to the counter and opened my mouth. Just let all the coins just fall out. I stared blankly for another few seconds and walked out with my honey. Every time was something equally crazy. Once, I just kept opening candy at the counter, taking one bite, and then dropping it and saying, it doesn't taste good. Why doesn't it taste good? I need it to taste good. Then I left a 20 in the counter and walked out. I'm not a thief. One time, I just cheerfully sang a cramp song and rearranged an entire aisle. Every time he tried to tell me to stop, I death glared him and sang louder. I visited him often for around six months. Sometimes I would act like he was my best friend and just hang out at the counter telling him random nonsensical stories. Sometimes I would act like I was so heartbroken and sad about, like, the donut display or something. But I never, ever let him speak. I would change my expression to a murder stare and keep talking but make my voice very loud and firm until he shut up. Eventually he developed a twitch and I could tell he was truly miserable so I felt done. My boyfriend really wanted to see this dude so I brought him in for one last visit, did a whole introduction like we were buddies. We both leaned on the counter drinking soda and eating candy for about 30 minutes. It was earlier than usual, so a few other people were in and out. We were cheerful as freak. I told him that I felt like he didn't like me as much as he used to. I told my boyfriend in front of him, he used to like me a lot. He liked me so much he tried to drag me into that back room over there. You gotta really like someone to do that. I asked him why he didn't like me as much as he used to. Told him I felt like I'd been a really good friend. I even come to see him all the time. I even eat candy that doesn't taste good and help arrange shelves and sing him songs. I acted so hurt. So my boyfriend acted really offended and asked him why he doesn't like me as much. He knew better than to speak by now so it was a real deer in headlights scenario. As we were leaving I said, oh I have a present for you but I forgot it. It's okay I'll just bring it to your house. Don't worry I wasn't following you or anything. I was just driving behind you and watching where you go. Bye. Then I never went back. I don't have any way of knowing if it worked, but my hope is that the next time this jerk wants to put his hands on a woman that doesn't want it, he remembers the six months of heck of the last one. I think regardless of response time, OP probably should have reported them, especially after the fact when they went there and basically got an admission of guilt. But man, that is a crazy form of revenge. Our next story is, my boss's golden retriever loves to bring squeaky toys to work. First thing, I love my boss's dog, Rory. I work in an office, and on most days when Rory comes to work, he's a joy. He's a golden retriever and is super well-behaved and happy, but sometimes, Rory brings a squeaky toy to work. 
My boss is seemingly immune to the squeaks, but for the rest of us, it's agony. It's like a squeak every 20 seconds. Usually we have to wait for Rory to chew through his toy squeakers. Hours. Days. We don't really want to say anything because he's so good, but one Monday, my will to ignore it broke. I had awoken with a pounding headache and the caffeine was not alleviating the pain. Each new squeak felt like the smallest of needles passing through my brain right behind my eyes. I'm not proud of this. Yes, I am. But my boy in IT has a cordless drill on hand that he let me borrow. I took Rory's pink penguin right from under his nose, faked a throw down the hall, and hid the stuffy in the back of my shirt. With Rory bewildered, I took the toy into my office and felt around the toy for the squeak valve. Once I found it, I took my pocket knife and made a small incision in the fuzzy layer, and with the borrowed IT drill, I carefully drilled a 1 8 inch hole through the squeaker's valve, silencing the animal forever before throwing it back to Rory. Now I just do it automatically when Rory gets a new squeaky toy. People seem to be genuinely grateful, and my boss assumes Rory chewed through his toy. Rory sounds adorable, the boss should know better. Our next story is, Lying X gets greedy, files for child support, and ends up with nothing. So back in March last year, I had tried settling with my ex for $100 above guideline, what state law recommends based on incomes and how often each parent has the children. Early last year, after we signed a stipulation agreement where I had 35% custody timeshare. I offered more because we make similar salaries, she makes slightly more, and felt bad because the amount wasn't that high. Long story, but prior to this, she was withholding the kids from me to try and set a precedent that I wasn't an every other weekend dad. That also did not go well for her, but she got greedy and thought negotiations were taking too long and that she could get more. So she ghosted me and filed with child support with an old address for me. DCSS tried super hard to push through a very high child support amount based on 0% custody and 0% income for her. Luckily, I had mail forwarding set up and put my phone number into the DCSS website. They called me and I was able to file an answer within the allotted time and stop them from defaulting me. It then took 8 months to get a hearing. The entire time, my ex could have been getting paid if she had settled. During this period, she lost some custody due to things unrelated to child support, so timeshare changed to 50-50. In her filings and at the hearing, she lied about the timeshare, trying to use a very old order that was only in place for about two months to claim that I had only 22% timeshare to get back pay. During the back pay period, I actually had the kids 45% of the time. I made sure to meticulously file all the relevant court orders, proof that I was exercising time with the kids, and a custody calendar that I'd kept. The outcome of all of this after almost a year? The judge ordered zero back pay and zero child support going forward. I am so relieved. My ex still refuses to pay half of any of the unreimbursed medical fees, but whatever, I pay them. Just as I provide school supplies, extracurricular payments, and purchase their clothes. So don't worry about her not being able to provide for the kids. She just bought her older son some $200 Jordans and a $100 lizard to replace the one she killed. I mean, hey, if OP's still covering all of the kind of extraneous stuff, that's still a pretty good deal for her considering she's got some kind of living situation and some kind of job. She clearly just wanted to milk OP for everything they could. Love that it backfired. Love that it wasn't a biased court. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely awesome story of revenge, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.